The following is a Metro TV special presentation. First of all, I want to welcome you to the Department of Public Health and Wellness and to our educational forum on e-cigs and hookah and the effects on indoor air quality. Uh, my name is Matt Rhodes and I serve as Deputy Director for the Department of Public Health and Wellness and I'm going to be charged with facilitating the conversation tonight. So you may be asking yourself, how did we get here and why are we here tonight? And that's a very good question. Um, the fact is, uh, Mayor Fisher, through resolution, tasked our department to study this issue and, and in fact he gave us four explicit explicit tasks with regard to this issue. The first task was to study the available research around e -cigs. The second issue was to study other cities and their related actions around this issue. The third task was to seek public input and the fourth task was to set up meetings where citizens could hear experts discuss research and offer opinions. So we feel as a department that we've largely met the first two bullet points and tonight we'll initiate the last two. We're going to have the opportunity for experts to discuss research and offer their opinions and then have opportunities for the public to provide input into this process. Just a couple of ground rules very quickly. The forum will be recorded by Metro TV, so it will be available for viewing later. Uh, there will be expert discussions. You've had, I think you all have an agenda. There will be three presentations. Following those presentations, we're gonna have a question and answer session and then an opportunity for public input. The, the panel will be set up following the three presentations and we'll have uh, a couple of other panelists that will join the three presenters to be able to answer those questions and provide further information for everyone here tonight. And with regards to the public input, it will be an open forum, so if you have questions or even have opinions of dissension, because we know that there may be some that have opinions that differ from the, the scientists that are here as well as our opinion as a public health agency, we encourage those. We want all of the feedback that we can get. The one thing that we do ask is that you speak into a microphone um, and the microphone is set up here that you can come up to this microphone or we're hopeful by the time that we set up the panelists that we'll have a handheld microphone that we can share around. But we just want to make sure that everyone can hear the comment and or question and also so that we can make sure that we gather all of those comments to be able to inform the process. And with that, I think we're going to get into the first presentation. The first presenter, or in fact, the first presentation is titled, Hookah in the Veal, Is There Cause for Concern? And our first presenter is Dr. Paul Kaiser. Dr. Kaiser received his master's and his doctoral degree from the University of Louisville School of Medicine, Department of Anatomical Sciences and Neurobiology. For nearly two decades, he has been involved at the local and state level studying and advocating for health policy initiatives and preventive efforts to reduce the health and economic burdens that the use of tobacco and tobacco related products place on our society. Accompanying this extensive history in public health, Dr. Kaiser has taught anatomy and physiology at Bellarmine University for 12 years. And I kidded him earlier, I didn't think he was old enough to have taught for 12 years already. Um, Dr. Kaiser has merged his passion for public health and his research agenda to focus his studies on further understanding the pervasiveness of alternative nicotine delivery systems in our community and the implications of this on the perceptions and use rates by college students in the region. So, Dr. Kaiser. There you go. Is that better? All right, I have students here, and they'll tell you I'm not one to stand behind a podium, so I wander, and I, I hope that's not a distraction or anything, but I kind of have to do it because it's who I am. Um, so there we are. Who can the bill? Is there cause for concern? And, and this is just to kind of frame the discussion, right? A lot of people 
kind of don't have a good understanding of who hookah actually is. Um, there's really kind of a, a misunderstanding in a lot of ways as to what hookah actually is and what's found in a, a hookah pipe. Um, and so I just had to reference the caterpillar because he may be the most famous hookah smoker of all time. All right, so real quick, what is hookah? That's kind of faded, but that's okay. Um, multiple names, and these are just a few of them. There's a lot more names for actually what a hookah pipe is. Shisha is actually the, the tobacco blend or herbal blend that goes into the hookah pipe, Nar Nargyle Argile water pipes. And basically, as you can kind of see here, does this thing have a laser? <laughs> it does, sort of. Um, hookah pipe basically consists of a bowl that sits at the top where you actually pack the uh, hookah itself, you put the, the shisha, the tobacco in, and then you cover that with some type of screen. Um, a lot of times it can just be a simple piece of aluminum foil with uh, holes punched in it or metal screens, formal foreign metal screens are actually screening, atop at which you place a burning coal. And that's something that already distinguishes hookah from other tobacco products. It's the burning coal that's placed on top of the hookah pipe that causes the combustion of the products inside the bowl that carries its own health risks beyond those associated with tobacco. It's literally if you take a piece of burning wood or a piece of burning coal and suck on it for 45 minutes, you're inhaling a lot of carbon monoxide and other chemicals that you don't necessarily get in other tobacco products. And so these can be, uh, the bowls can, can actually be fruit bowls or, or other metal bowls. But what's happened then is you have the hose that you, you suck on, you draw the smoke down through um, a bottle of sorts, all different shapes and sizes, that contain water. There's a lot of misperceptions about the water filters the smoke. The water does not filter the smoke at all. The water cools the smoke is all it does, which makes it easier. You don't get that necess necessarily get that catch that you get with a burning hot cigarette as that smoke enters your lung you or enters your airway. Um, you just get more of a, a cool sensation of, of happy flavor um, filled with nicotine and lots of other chemicals. Um, and so this is just a couple, not a couple, there's a, a good handful here, of the places in town um, that are available right now offering hookah. I'm not going to run through all of them. It's nice advertising though, I guess, but there are many. And, and, and they come and go. There's really about eight, I'd say, that have been here consistently for at least three years. Um, others open and close. They, they don't necessarily sustain themselves. And I'll, I'll show you a map later of a little bit where they are pretty well located within the city. You'll see kind of a trend with that. Um, and so this is just an overview, and, and this is the happy things that occur there, right? And so hookah originated in the Middle East, in Turkey, right, in, in the Middle East area anyways in general, and it was really a social activity um, to sit around and smoke with your friends. Um, much like other alternative to, back, to tobacco products, we would say, well, you know, it's just something else to try, it's just something else to do, especially for smokers that already smoke, it's an alternative for them, it's another option, a different way to get your nicotine. But when you can look, I don't see a lot of middle-aged people here just alternatively smoking hookah um, in, in these lounges. It's, it's mostly kids and it's mostly college kids. It's only been just over a year, year and a half that it actually became illegal for people over or under 18 to consume hookah. Um, and so it is a teen and late teen, early 20s activity that, that drives this, and, and that's a cause for concern. So some of the myths I hear as a university professor working with undergraduate students is hookah isn't as addictive as smoking actually is. The water filters the smoke. I've said that before. Hookah is just a harmless social activity. It's a way to gather. It's for kids that aren't yet 21 to go experience the bar experience. You're hanging out in the lounge. You're enjoying yourself. You're having a good time. Um, and so hookah's natural, I've heard that. How could it be bad, it's natural? Well, coca leaves and opium are natural and they're not necessarily good for you either. And so the great hookah hoax that comes with this, I got this from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, they put this together. But this is showing a single hookah session compared to a single cigarette. A single hookah session takes about 45 minutes or so um, to smoke all of the shisha in the tobacco pipe compared to eight puffs in a single cigarette, right? And there's a little variability in those eight puffs. Some are seven and a half, some go to eight and a half, but it's about eight puffs in a single drag. So the first major significant difference between a hookah pipe and a cigarette is the volume of smoke that you actually inhale into your lungs. And so the quantifiable sum 
of the quantifiable measures that come with that increased volume of smoke. So this is, again, one hookah bowl compared to one cigarette. So it's really not a fair, fair uh, comparison. The, the actual measured difference in the volume of smoke is they say that one bowl of hookah is about the same amount of smoke as 100 cigarettes. Smoked in 45 minutes. Um, so the tar values, tar is, again, just burnt carbon. That's what tar is. When they talk about tar in cigarettes, it's just the burnt material that actually collects in your lungs. Obviously, much higher levels um, in a whole bowl of tobacco than in a single cigarette, 36 times as much. Nicotine values actually aren't that much higher. And that's a misperception throughout the, the uh, really smoking world is that nicotine is the bad thing in tobacco. Nicotine isn't necessarily the danger. Nicotine is the addicting drug, right? And two high concentrations of nicotine are certainly toxic. You can absolutely positively die from nicotine overdose. We're in Kentucky. A lot of people know tobacco farmers. If you know anybody who grows tobacco, you don't go out in a green field in the early morning when the field is wet. You get tobacco sickness. That's nicotine poisoning from the water that's on the leaves getting into your hands and into your skin if you're walking through a wet field. So nicotine is toxic. It is bad. It's an insecticide. <laughs> they spray it on other plants to keep the bugs off it. But it's not really the danger, right? It's all the carcinogens. It's the other products, the other chemicals that are found in the smoke. When you look at carbon monoxide levels, this is where that coal on top really makes the big difference. The carbon monoxide levels from sucking on a coal for 45 minutes are eight and a half times almost what you get from a single burnt cigarette. And carbon monoxide is not good, right? Carbon monoxide, obviously, that's what's in you know, car exhaust that, that when, when people die from overexposure of carbon monoxide um, and car exhaust or all the, the tragic stories we hear in the winter where people are heating with propane in their house. Carbon monoxide kills, and this is voluntarily taking that into your lungs. So um, without going into all of the studies, I found these two great articles that are summary articles. And wow, those are really hard to read on the screen. Um, but this is a summary article that looked at 54 different studies, um, came down to about 10%. Whoopsie, missed, made all the criteria um, to be considered in this so that we had an equal comparison. And basically, I just wanted to read, this is hookah smoking in general, all right? Um, WPS is water pipe smoking. Water pipe smoking is associated with a variety of adverse short-term and long-term health effects that should reinforce the need for stronger regulation. In addition, this review highlights the limitations of the public work, which is mostly cross-sectional perspective. Um, prospective studies should be undertaken to assess the full spectrum of health entities of water pipe smoking, particularly in view of its growing popularity and attractiveness to youth. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit here. And so this next study is another review article. And this review article um, came out with 11 studies that had been 11 other published studies they reviewed and combined all the data on. And this was about secondhand smoke of hookah, right? That's really the, the big concern for this, is we're talking about opening up our current comprehensive secondhand smoke ordinance that we have here in Louisville that's done a tremendous job of not only reducing smoking, but certainly reducing exposure to tobacco in our community. And so we're talking about opening that up to include e-cigs and hookah. And so we need to say, all right, is there a real health need to do this? This is not necessarily about protecting individual hookah users. This is, that's important, and we need to do that, and we need to help people quit smoking that want to quit smoking, but this is about protecting everyone else. That was the motivation 10 years ago when we passed the current secondhand smoke ordinance here in Louisville. It was about protecting other people from the actions of those that were addicted to nicotine. And so this is a study of secondhand smoke of hookah, a comprehensive analysis, a research article of secondhand smoke analysis. The negative health consequences of secondhand smoke water pipe exposure have major implications for clean indoor air laws and for occupational safety. There exists an urgent need for public health campaigns about the effects on children and household members from smoking water pipe at home and further development and implementation of regulations to protect the health of the public from this rapidly emerging threat. And we'll touch more about how rapidly emerging it is in a moment. This is a study done in my lab where we went and we sampled air quality in hookah lounges and in other non-hookah places in town. So we did some coffee houses, we did some small restaurants who were comparable size to the hookah lounges in town. We sampled seven, there were only seven at the time, hookah lounges and seven um, non-smoking establishments. So what you're seeing here is research of particulate matter, 2.5 microns or smaller. That is what is defined as respirable particles. It's things that we can inhale that get down into our lungs. And as you can rather plainly see, 
very small levels of respirable particles in the non-smoking lounges, whereas in the smoking hookah lounges, we have very high levels, over 200 um, parts per million of uh, um, respirable particles, PM 2.5. This bar over here on the side, this is the National Ambient Air Quality Study for outdoor air. There is no national um, set baseline for indoor air quality, and so that's what they use for outdoor air quality. If you walk down Louisville and you got uh, particulate matter is over 35, um, 35 micrograms per cubic meter, then that there's air pollution, okay, in an outdoor air. So this is indoor air quality compared to the national outdoor air quality standard. All right, so what about the nicotine? Well, the issue arises is that many establishments in our community that sell hookah claim they don't have nicotine in their product. They're selling hookah that is herbal, or they're using the stones that are nicotine-laced. Um, but they're saying it's not tobacco. Well, this is a study that very plainly and very explicitly analyzed the effects of non-tobacco hookah and the health effects compared to tobacco hookah. And the results were as follows. Um, although these demonstrate that water pipe tobacco smoking produces some effects likely due to the nicotine, cardiovascular response to get all the stimulatory responses of the nicotine, there are some effects likely due to other factors. And then they go through and talk about some of the other dependents and how these things form. But also notable is the observation that using a water pipe to smoke a non-tobacco product results in a substantial level of carbon monoxide exposure that did not differ from that observed when smoking tobacco under identical conditions. Some water pipe smokers may believe that non-tobacco products can be used to reduce exposure to smoke toxicants. However, while nicotine exposure is clearly eliminated, carbon monoxide exposure is not. Moreover, charcoal is the source of carbon monoxide and carcinogenic polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in water pipe smoke. Thus, aside from the dependence, the health risk of using a water pipe to smoke non-tobacco preparations may be similar to those of a smoking tobacco whenever the charcoal is the heat source. So this is saying that it doesn't matter. If you're smoking non-tobacco um, hookah or tobacco hookah, the health effects are very similar, and the secondhand smoke exposure is the same. So it's not a good thing. The health agencies are virtually unanimous. Uh, and I'm, well, I'll write them off. American Association, a Medical Association, Association for Pediatrics, Lung Association, Cancer Society, Heart Association, Center for Disease Control, Food and Drug Administration, World Health Organization, National Center for Tobacco-Free Kids, and many, many more all agree. Hookah is a growing health, public health threat, especially to minors and young adults, and must be regulated immediately. They have made official statements saying regulations are important to restrict exposure to secondhand smoke from hookah. The industry, the nicotine industry, we can't really say the tobacco industry anymore, the nicotine industry is adapting very, very, very quickly. This is what the problem is. Among high school students, this is this year's April 2016 MMWR, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, that comes from the CDC looking at tobacco use among middle and high school students. Tobacco use of cigarettes is dropping among high school students and has been. We've been winning the battle to reduce smoking among high school and middle school students in this country. Sadly, it's going the other way for e-cigs and for hookah. E-cigs over the past four years, 2011 to 2015, e-cigs have gone from 1.5% consumption to 16% consumption among high school students. Hookah use from 4.1% up to 7.2%. So roughly one in 12, right, high school kids are using hookah. And this is a graph showing that. And here you can see, here's e-cig use in that time. Cigarette use going the other way. Cigars going down. Hookahs going up, right? Smokeless going down, pipe tobacco going down. Secondhand smoke policies across the country are working to reduce the desire, the prevalence, the, the exposure to these products. When we all grew up, people my age and even younger, every restaurant we went into, you had the option of do you want to smoke or not, right? That was your choice when you went in, right? They don't get that anymore. We've changed the culture, we've changed the environment. By allowing these places to continue in our community, that culture is gonna go back the other way and is going back the other way with respect to these alternative products. So here's middle school, 0.6% to 5.3. You're like, those aren't big numbers, these are middle school kids, right? You got uh, one in 20 middle school kids is using e-cigs and one out of 50 have already used hookah in middle school in the United States. And so same thing, e-cig use going up, Cigarettes going down, cigars going down, hookah going up, uh, smoke, smokeless tobacco and pipe going down. So this, I'll be really quick with. This is a study we did in our lab, um, one of my research students did last semester uh, in the spring. And this was looking at perceptions among college students 
of hookah use and e-cigs. We took two campuses, Bellarmine and IUS, and I'll show you why that's relevant in a minute. Right? Looking at the perception of risk of use of hookah users, Bellarmine hookah users, right? they had a lower perceived risk of hookah use. This is the, the actual statement was hookah is less dangerous. So more people believed hookah was less dangerous than those that did not use. IUS, same thing, right? But IUS also, this is a statistically significant difference. IUS hookah users had a um, less perceived risk than Bellarmine students. ESIG perceptions, amongst each campus, here's Bellarmine to Bellarmine, user versus non-user, IUS, user to non-user. Differences among, um, between users and non-users, but no differences between campuses, all right, on those, those two different facts. When you look at those that have visited a hookah lounge versus not, those that have visited have a lower perceived risk, imagine that, than those that have not. The reason this is relevant, um, this is just restating those, and I'm out of time, so I'm going to kind of fly by that. That's restating this. I'll happily share them with you. They're on the thing. But this is why, right? Here's IUS up across from the river. The red dots, those are the hookah lounges last semester uh, in the spring that were in town, all right, at the time, the active hookah lounges that were open. So all the red dots. This is Old Louisville. This is Bardstown Road. Here's Bellarmine. Here's UofL. There's IUS. IUS had no hookah lounges last semester, all right? So when you look at this, you say, gee, what did we know? E-cig distribution, e-cig perceptions were equal between IUS and Bellarmine. When you look at the e-cig stores, the vapor stores, and these are just vapor stores. These aren't every convenience store in town that sells e-cigs. These are just these specialty vapor stores in town, all the green dots. When you look at the green dots, there's more or less an equal distribution up around IUS and in the city of Louisville, right? East end, west end, south end. There's not so much in the west end. That's interesting. Um, but a whole different study um, of, of e-cig stores, right? So there was no perception of risk differences between the two campuses where they have equal numbers of stores in the area. However, there was perception of risk differences. The Bellarmine students here, surrounded by the hookah lounges, had a lower perceived risk of the hazards of hookah smoke than the IUS students who did not. And so it's a study we just found. It really kind of took us by surprise. I wasn't actually looking for those numbers. It's when we crunched the data. We're like, well, look at that. Um, and so it's something that I think really makes the case for we need to get ahead of this, right? Our high school students, our middle school students are always using these at a higher rate. We need to change the perception so that we reduce those numbers. Thank you very much. And this is just a summary of that. So that's my last little thought. Thank you, Paul. We're going to go ahead and move right along into the second presentation, but I did want to share with you that all of the slides from the presentations are available on our website, will be available uh, at the conclusion of this meeting, and that's www.louisvilleky.gov slash health. So uh, our next presenter is Dr. Ari Bachnager, and he is um, a PhD. He received his PhD in chemistry from the University of Kampur and completed his postdoctoral research in 1990 at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. He is presently a professor of medicine and Smith and Lucille Gibson chair in the Department of Medicine at the University of Louisville. He was elected a fellow of the American Heart Association in 2005. He is currently the director of the Diabetes and Obesity Center at the University of Louisville, where he leads a large multidisciplinary team of investigators studying how diabetes and obesity affect cardiovascular health and disease. He is also the co-director of the American Heart Association Tobacco Addiction and Research Center. He is the deputy editor of Circulation Research. In 2014, he chaired a panel of experts who wrote the American Heart Association statement on e-cigarettes. He has published 200 peer-reviewed manuscripts, 25 book chapters and reviews, and over 200 abstracts. And his presentation is Secondhand Exposure to E-Cigarettes. Thank you. You can take that out. Okay. Well, thank you. This is a pleasure to come here and talk to people about uh, some of the issues that we've been worried about and been working on for a long time. And as you all know, the reason that we are interested in e-cigarettes because they have actually gained uh, enormous popularity in the last few years. The use of e-cigarettes has exploded, and that not only that there is one type or two type of e-cigarettes, but there's a whole plethora of e-cigarettes that you can now get, and they come in different 
shapes and sizes and flavors and usage, use patterns. And this is an ever evolving field. And we see that what the research that we do with one particular product within a few months that becomes obsolete. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have a variety of different flavors and there is a, a lively debate on the use and the necessity of, of having these flavors and how they should be regulated. But regardless, to date we have about over uh, 4,000 to 7,000 different flavors that are available, which is astonishing given that this, is only, this industry is only a few years old. So what is an e-cigarette? And, and again, uh, as soon as you put something up a slide like this, it becomes obsolete. These, this is the first generation e-cigarette. And what it has is that it would have uh, a sort of a light here that would sort of simulate the uh, sort of sensation of smoking. There's a battery and a microprocessor, and it heats or vaporizes the nicotine. And, and this is a cartridge that holds the nicotine in a particular vehicle, and that's where the emission uh, occurs, which gives a sensation of smoke. So this was um, invented and patented in China by this guy who was worried about his father having lung cancer, so he thought maybe he could develop a device where you could take nicotine without the harmful effects. So the, the uh, minimalist approach that he had was if you take nicotine and put it in some sort of a, uh, a carrier gas that you could uh, get rid of the combustion products, which he and others understood are the main miscreants and the main problems with, with cigarettes. So uh, this was rapidly uh, sort of spread all over the world and was embraced by many sectors of society, thinking that these are much safer, cleaner alternatives to, to combustion products like cigarettes, and that, that's what we should sort of worry about. But what do these things contain? They contain, in addition to nicotine, of course, which is the main purpose, although some devices now don't contain nicotine, uh, they contain uh, nicotine, uh, and this is derived from tobacco, and there has been a lot of discussion, in, both in the FDA as well as the Supreme Court, whether we are going to think of these products as tobacco products or, or tobacco-derived products. The industry has argued that because there is no tobacco, it's, it's uh, silly to call them tobacco-derived products. But on the other hand, the government has argued that these are derived from tobacco, so they could be tobacco-derived products. So regardless of whatever definition we adopt, currently it is under the jurisdiction of the FDA because it's considered a tobacco-derived product. Uh, it, but it contains nicotine that's been extracted from tobacco, so it's relatively clean nicotine, and it's heated. So it's, this is the main critical difference. It's not burned like in tobacco where you have a very high temperature and burns the tobacco leaf to extract the nicotine out of the smoke so you can inhale it. It is actually just heated. And when you heat it, it actually uh, just gen comes up in the vapor form. So the levels of most of the chemicals that we've seen in cigarettes and we're worried about, things like tar, carbon monoxide, are not present in e-cigarettes, and therefore uh, some people have believed that there could be much lower risk of these devices than conventional cigarettes. <clears throat> However, the yields of these chemicals vary with the duration of the puff and the voltage and the type of temperature that you can attain in e-cigarettes, and that's variable now. And also that these cigarettes can contain some of the constituents that actually have been linked to the health effects associated with combustible cigarettes. And we are con particularly concerned about two chemicals. One, are these, some, one is a group of chemicals called the aldehydes, and the other one you already heard about, which is the particulate matter, or, or PM, which is similar to the ambient PM present in, uh, in ambient air. So nicotine, generally people believe that people, uh, nicotine is, is innocuous, and it's not the nicotine that actually kills you, it's the, it's the tar. But since we are from the American Heart Association, we worry about the blood pressure and we worry about heart, we think that nicotine has a significant effect on, on our cardiovascular health because nicotine can increase, uh, can increase heart rate. Uh, you can measure it right away after smoking one cigarette. You change, see changes in blood pressure, which we think that these persistent increases in heart rate and blood pressures are not a good thing to have. Um, of course, everybody knows that, that nicotine can enhance cognition. That's why some people feel very active and alert and, and in some senses, happy after smoking. There is this belief that, it, that nicotine also suppresses appetite. That's why people use it for losing weight. Yeah, but it affects uh, the metabolism and the release of several neurotransmitters, such as dopamine, which gives us the pleasant sensation that people become dopamine junkies. That's why they're uh, smoking, because of the positive feelings they get from it. But you also increase norepinephrine and epinephrine, and both these uh, hormones can actually enhance or accelerate cardiovascular disease. So those are causes of concern. Um, 
But in addition to nicotine, uh, e-cigs contain propylene glycol and has generally been considered non-toxic, but not, nobody has been exposed to propylene glycol or whatever five times or 10 times a day for, for dozens of years. So we do not know what the toxicity of this uh, chemical is. It is used as a solubilizing agent in some medication. Uh, it's used to generate theater fog, although now people don't do that anymore. They're using dry ice rather than, than propylene glycol. Um, and it's been used in the aviation in, in industry. We do know that prolonged exposure is not very healthy and that, com and that this could be of concern, especially in people who are uh, allergic or who have asthma or who are sensitive to, to this chemical. Uh, the thing is the way it is prepared, sometimes it contains antifreeze, which is really toxic, and, and trace levels of, of this related compound has been detected in e-cigarettes. One other cause of concern are the chemicals uh, are known as aldehydes, and some of these uh, have, you've heard about them, and there's been a, 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 a sort of a lot of debate in the literature about how much they produce and what can they do. Uh, we do know that they are, they're toxic, they can cause cancer, they can uh, accelerate heart disease, and so we're concerned about them. The levels of uh, two or three of them, for example, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and acrolein, which, uh, which is, uh, acrolein is, is a chemical or an aldehyde generated from burning of um, any type of fossil fuel. It, it's, it is acrid, and that's where the acrid smell of smoke comes from, so that's why it's called acrolein. And so it, some of the levels of these compounds are similar between e-cigarettes and in, in uh, conventional cigarettes. The ranges overlap. And so even though uh, many devices have much lower levels of these chemicals, some of them have uh, detectable levels of these chemicals, where others have these chemicals in the same concentration that they are present in cigarettes, and that's a cause of concern. Uh, but uh, importantly, there, are, there is uh, particulate matter, and this is what, what we were talking about, uh, what Paul is talking about, PM and PM 2.5. So as you can see, if you look at a conventional cigarette, uh, conventional cigarette here, you can see that there is a peak at around 2.5 microns, which is or about 165 nanometers. So normally, there is a distribution of sizes of particles. Uh, and so these particles, some of them are inhaled, and some are, are taken out by your airways, the cigarette industry has sort of perfected this, so they have developed these particle sizes in a very narrow window, so it doesn't irritate your throat and gets into your deep lung very easily. So this is a perfectly manufacturing killing machine, which actually delivers the most deadly form of these particles in the highest possible concentration. And uh, the idea was that it wouldn't irritate people. If you have a particles that are large that would irritate, the people would not smoke. Um, that's what actually happened with the original cigarettes, so I'd roll your own cigarettes, contain different types of particles. So e-cigs have, have the particles that are very similar to that present in conventional cigarettes. There is no difference in concentrations. And we are worried about these particles because we know from other research that low levels of these particles can be toxic and cause cardiovascular disease. We think that these particles, when they're present in ambient air, kill people. For every 10 microgram per meter cube increase in particle, PM2.5 levels, there is a 1 to 4 percent increase in cardiovascular mortality. And this is only 10 microgram. And let me show you the, and the levels that are, are attained in, with cigarettes and with e-cigarettes could go into hundreds of micrograms. So it's like, like air pollution in Beijing rather than air pollution in in Louisville. So we, do, we know very precious uh, little about what uh, the e-cigarettes do. There are some studies showing that acute effects can cause increases in, in uh, the air resistance or airways in your lung, and that, uh, but others have found really not very large effects. Um, there is some recent studies showing that e-cigarettes can also interfere with your endothelial function or the function of relaxation of the blood vessels, but we haven't had people uh, using them for a long time to know what the long-term consequences would be. So the, the important point here uh, that I want to make in specifically is that the relationship between the toxicity and, and dose in cigarettes as well as in air pollution is nonlinear. So you could get um, about 80% of the harm from smoking three cigarettes of what you would get from smoking two packs. So this is uh, for cardiovascular mortality. The cancer effects are different. The cancer goes linear. The more you smoke, the more risk of cancer you get. But for heart disease, it's saturated two to three cigarettes or four, maybe five cigarettes. So even if the effects of e-cigarettes are much, much lower, suppose they are 30% as toxic and as normal cigarettes, we don't know how much, but suppose that they were, we would not see a significant harm reduction because that there would be, because of this nonlinear relationship. 
right? So it is important to remember that even though people tout e-cigarettes having containing much, much, much less levels of these toxic substances, we do not know how much less that means in terms of harm or toxicity rather in terms of concentration. So people have measured the levels of, of these uh, nicotine as well as PM2.5 in people who have been uh, vaping in these closed areas or in different scenarios. And what they found was that the, although much less than nicotine, uh, than conventional cigarettes, there's still measurable levels of nicotine that are present in the environment. We could see levels of PM. And let me remind you, so I was saying, and, and, and Paul was showing that, so if like 30 microgram is a big um, sort of event, a pollution day, and we can get about hundreds of micrograms with people smoking e-cigarettes indoors. So this is a, a, a really a cause of concern. They have done a variety of other studies in which they show that there are spikes of these uh, aerosol particles. Uh, what people generally say is e-cigarettes uh, have vapor. They, it, that's completely wrong. What e-cigarettes emit is an aerosol. The difference between a vapor and an aerosol is that a vapor is just vaporized gas. The aerosol is a gas in which particles are suspended. So e-cigarettes is not a vapor, it is uh, aerosol. But aerosol is not a, not a very fashionable word, so not easy to say, so we, we, people refer to this as vaping. Um, the, you can see that there's increase in these particles in time. Uh, it, as you can see over here, I mean, somebody's vaping, but also with, uh, if you increase the temperature of the e-cigarettes. Of the e um, and in a variety of, of settings, if you have a, a cafe-like setting, or you have people vaping or using e-cigarettes in rooms, or in home-like settings, you could see measurable effects. For example, if there was a person smoking e-cigarettes in a house for a week, you could get uh, about tenfold high levels of nicotine in that environment. So this is almost as, as much as, as somebody smoking in that house. Um, if, even if you do a ventilated chamber study, you get the same amount of uh, sort of nicotine. And this is really significant because when they compare people smoking and people not smoking uh, and people vaping or, or using e-cigs, the secondhand exposure was about the same. You get the same amount of nicotine as a bystander if somebody was smoke, vaping or using e-cigarettes next to you, or if somebody was smoking a cigarette next to you. So although the deadly combustion products may be reduced, the amount of nicotine delivered is about the same. And so when we talk about indoor smoking ban, it comes to be, to be somewhat of a, a personal rights issue that, that a person next to another one has a right of not being involuntarily exposed to a psychoactive and a vasoactive substance without their permission or consent. And so that's an argument of not uh, permitting e-cigarette use in all places that we can. And then there is these, uh, the e-cig events. People join, go to these events, and they have these vaping competitions. They have uh, competitions who, much, who can blow the biggest amount of bubble and biggest amount of uh, smoke cloud. And therefore, that, those areas, and as you can see uh, here, that those areas have high levels of, of this vape or aerosol. And it's actually been measured, and what the measurements show that these PM levels can actually go to up to 600 to 700. And this are very, very high levels. Remember, for every 10 microgram, there's a 1 to 4% increase in cardiovascular disease deaths and mortality. And these are going up to 400 to 700 micrograms per meter cube. So these, are, these environments are certainly not healthy and certainly not something that we could accept as from, from a public health standpoint. But finally, I think that the, the most uh, sort of important point that I want to make was was this. For many years, we have actually uh, campaigned against the use of cigarettes and against the spread of cigarettes in youth and in, in adults. And one of the reasons why we've been so successful is that we've been able to, and this is from the American Heart Association, American Lung Association, we've been able to denormalize smoking. That we have been able to, to, uh, to convey to kids that smoking is not Cool, it's not acceptable, it's not a social practice that we condone. We have, and I mean, we and the entire public health community has hounded the uh, advertisement agencies, the radios, uh, the uh, TV shows, movies, to minimize the appearance of, of, of smoking. And even in movies, we don't uh, condone uh, actor smoking, we don't let the tobacco industry sponsor sporting events, we don't want tobacco and smoking within our environment and within the visibility of our kids. And so I can tell you, like for my kids, they've never seen anybody smoke in, in, in close to them, ever. They've not seen uh, tobacco advertisements on, uh, on TV, movies, and channels. It's not cool. So if we permit people vaping or smoking indoors, then we run the risk of normalizing this behavior again. 
And that would, would lead to this epidemic, which has already started, that there is this increase exposure to smoking. And we know that kids who can see other people smoking or, you, or see other people using these devices are tempted to use them. And so these act like gateway drugs. And you, you uh, sort of subconsciously allow them or give them permission to indulge in this sort of behavior. And this is a dangerous trend. We've seen that 8% of our youth are now have, re have reported using e-cigarettes, and there are several million kids around this country. And that uh, we should do all we can to implement existing laws and have uh, the um, uh, sort of enforcement of clean air laws that have worked for our anti-smoking campaigns, and so they should work for the, um, the anti-e-cigarette campaigns as well. So as, as public health activists, we are concerned that, these, um, that we should consider these, these products seriously because they might be in some, self, uh, some sense sort of wolf in sh you know, sheep, wolf and sheep clothing. And so we need to be careful about their use and spread in society. And certainly uh, public health people in the, uh, lung, in the American Lung Soci uh, Association, American Heart, and American Cancer are, are worried about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next presentation is titled Electronic Smoking Devices and Hookah Implications for Policy. And the presenter is Monica Monday. Mundy. I'm sorry, Monica Mundy. That was an easy name to pronounce and I made a mistake. So she um, has a master's in public health. Monica is a program coordinator for Fresh, Freedom for Radon Exposure and Smoking in the Home, Research Study, and a Community Advisor for the Kentucky Center for Smoke Free Policy. Monica is a PhD student in kinesiology and health promotion at the University of Kentucky. Monica received her Bachelor of Arts in Communication from University of Kentucky and Master of Public Health from Eastern Kentucky University. So please welcome Monica Mundy. There we go. Thank you for having me this evening. I want to talk a little bit about the need to include e-cigarettes and hookah in all smoke-free policies to protect workers from harmful air pollution. And we've heard from our wonderful experts before me, um, and we know that e-cigarettes pollute the air. Um, e-cigarettes don't emit um, products of combustion, um, like a burning cigarette, but they do emit secondhand aerosol, and they contain tiny particles and toxic gases um, that we see in secondhand smoke. And these tiny particles and toxic gases cause heart and lung disease and cancer. And e-cigarette particles can reach concentrations almost as high as in Lexington before their smoke-free law. And to give you a frame of reference, um, in Lexington, before their smoke-free law, their PM 2.5 was 199. And the outdoor standard, as you've heard before, is 35. Um, the aerosol, it does give off the aerosol and not a water vapor, and it does contain um, different... Um, items, one being propylene glycol, and it can be a lung irritant, um, eye irritant. Formaldehyde can cause cancer. Nicotine, we know it's addictive. It affects fetal development, um, and it can contribute to heart and lung disease and cancer. Get it together. There we go. And we also know that e-cigarettes um, may encourage dual use um, versus switching um, altogether. So let's talk a little bit about support for e-cigarettes e and smoke-free laws. Um, there is bipartisan um, support throughout all these organizations um, to regulate um, where smoking and tobacco products are used, and for that to also um, include e-cigarettes, and that includes the American Society for Heating, Refrigerating, Air Conditioning Engineers, um, the World Health Organization, um, the ACS CAN, American Heart Association, American Lung Association, Americans for Non-Smokers' Rights, and currently in Kentucky, we have 14 communities um, that do include e-cigarettes in their smoke-free laws, um, the most recent being the city of Litchfield, which actually goes into effect January 1st, 2017. 
And to talk a little bit about hookah, um, we do know um, that hookah also pollutes the air. Um, as we heard, a typical hookah session is like smoking 100 conventional cigarettes. And a study in Lexington, in a Lexington Kentucky hookah lounge found that that particulate matter, that P, um, PM 2.5, was found to be three to six times higher um, than the outdoor standard. So hookah lounges are often included under a tobacco retailer exemption or a tobacco business exemption. Um, currently, 28 Kentucky smoke-free laws exempt retail tobacco establishments. So um, they, in essence, allow um, hookah lounges. And language can be included in the definition of smoking to permit hookah use. And we currently have six communities um, that do have a broad enough definition of smoking um, to cover um, hookah lounges and hookah smoking. So exempting hookah lounges leaves workers unprotected protected from secondhand smoke. In 2010, um, the FDA wanted to regulate e-cigarettes um, as a nicotine delivery device. And a judge actually um, decided in the favor of the company that makes Enjoy e-cigarettes and said, no, it's actually a tobacco product. So if you fast forward to 2016, the FDA has put into effect a deeming rule. And this extends jurisdiction um, to e-cigarettes, all cigars, hookah, and other products. Um, it does not allow for modified risk claims. Um, it does require the listing of potential harmful um, additives in the aerosol, and there are no restrictions on flavorings in internet sales. Um, but this deeming rule does not protect workers um, from secondhand smoke or aerosol, so it does not cover smoke-free laws. So really the bottom line is that electronic smoking devices and hookah pollutes the air. This is a public health concern. Um, E-cigarette and hookah products um, should be treated um, as just like tobacco products in smoke-free policies. Covering e-cigarettes and hookah um, in all smoke-free laws, we should also use a broad definition of smoking that can be adapted um, to cover future tobacco products, remove tobacco business exemptions, and protect all workers from exposure to e-cigarette and hookah smoke, um, and Louisville can do this by just making small modifications to their current law. Um, thank you. Again, we're gonna allow for all community feedback and we want to have all of those comments made into the microphone, if we could, please. So we're going to start transitioning now into our panel discussion. So if we can start that process, the, the one thing that I wanted to do is recognize two other individuals that are going to join the panel. First is Dr. Robert Jacobs. He's a PhD. Dr. Jacobs is a professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences and director of the Masters of Public Health program. Dr. Jacobs received his bachelor's and master's from Baylor University and his PhD in environmental sciences and engineering from the School of Public Health at the University of North Carolina. Dr. Jacobs has published over 60 peer-reviewed articles, 14 book chapters, and given over 40 presentations. Dr. Jacobs' research interests include health effects associated with indoor air and exposures to organic dust in agricultural and industrial environments, inhalation toxicology, International Environmental and Occupational Health Practices. So welcome, Dr. Jacobs, and thank you for being here. And lastly, uh, we have Carol Riker. She has a Master's of Science in Nursing, and she's also an RN, and she'll be joining us. Carol is Associate Professor Emeritus, is a faculty associate with Breathe and the Kentucky Center for Smoke-Free Policy. Riker provided intensive technical assistance when the Madison County Board of Health faced a challenge from e-cigarette proponents who strongly opposed strengthening their smoke-free regulation in 2011. She also provided health content expertise to the attorney who developed the amicus briefs submitted to the Kentucky Court of Appeals and the Kentucky Supreme Court while they were considering Bullitt County Board of Health's authority to adopt a smoke-free regulation for all workplaces. 
Riker received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Michigan and her Master's Degree from the University of Kentucky. So if we can have all of the panelists come up and have a seat at our table here, we do have mics on the tables. And the first thing that I want to do, we have the three presenters and the other two individuals join them in for a panel discussion. And again, this is going to be the opportunity for community to ask questions or make statements and provide the public input into this process, which we certainly hope will be um, informative to the process as we have this community discussion and make decisions how we proceed forward with this particular issue. So again, I think um, we have our panel here and uh, we didn't go over this, but Dr. Jacobs and uh, Carol, if you all have anything that you would like to add before we start taking questions, we can certainly give you the opportunity to do that. We're going to try to get this light turned off so you're not blinded uh, by the light. There we go. Great. So um, if, if you all would like to make any opening statements, I'll open the floor to you now and um, certainly don't want to put you on the spot, but we'll take questions and move along however you all prefer. Go right ahead. I would just say that um, nicotine, as Dr. Philip Gardner is fond of saying, nicotine is no free lunch. So I think we have covered that with the, with the panel, but I want people to realize that. Great. And I'll look forward to the questions. Okay. So are there any questions or comments? We do have a handheld mic, but we would like for you to come up if we can, get you to come up to the mic up front. So. Thank you. And I may have more questions later, but first was just a clarification about the difference between vapor and aerosol. I wasn't much aware of that. I don't think it was explained. So just de a little detail of what actually is aerosol compared to vapors. Yes, so vapor is when you take a gas and you vaporize it. So you just have water, for instance, and you just heat water and you get steam. And whereas uh, aerosol is something that you have steam, but in the sense there's also uh, particles suspended in it. So there, when you have a mixture of gas and particles, that's an aerosol, and a vapor is gas. <clears throat> Hello, I see a lot of young faces out here. I'm uh, Tony Florence. I'm uh, one of the board members of the Kentucky Smoke Free Association for the e-cigarette advocacy group for Kentucky. And although I appreciate the large volumes of scientific data that you put on the wall, I can't help but notice a lot of it is fairly dated, 2009, 2010, 2011. And as we all know, this is a very volatile science. Lots of things change. I have a couple of questions. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of it because you're in this, you know, where the industry, uh, but Public Health England, put out a study, uh, it's adopted by their entire health department, that says e-cigarettes are 95% safer than smoking. Uh, the BAT just recently came out with another study uh, that said that the excellent, the secondhand vapor, 99% less toxic than smoke uh, from a standard cigarette. Um, couple this with the factor, I mean, e-cigarettes are much maligned by a lot of people, and I get it, I mean, in a perfect world, no one would smoke, no one would use e-cigarettes, that's great, but that's not the case. Um, but anyway, like in the EU, they just put out another study, 6.1 million people have stopped smoking because of e-cigarettes. Nine million have had a drastic reduction in physical cigarette smoke use. Uh, so there's obviously a tangible benefit. I mean, smoking kills 480,000 people a year, roughly. E-cigarettes, you know, there's not a lot of science out there yet, but I haven't heard of anybody dying from uh, just, you know, vaping as it's intended to be used. Uh, so what is your all's opinion about this? Because even in England, they've adopted a workplace policy that allows for people to be accommodated who like to use their e-cigarette device because according to them and their entire health department of England, that there's no noticeable or not a substantial amount of any type of toxicity to what is being put out, non-determinable uh, amounts, non-quantifiable, parts per million insignificant, that kind of thing. So I'd like your opinion on that. So let me start. There is, of course, this is a very contentious issue. Mm -hmm. So across here in the United States, uh, we think that the idea that, or the, the declaration that e-cigarettes are 95% safer is a mistake. We think that's not, and they admit 
It's not based on any evidence, but a, a set of experts' opinion. It's peer reviewed studies. In no, England. it was it was not peer reviewed. It was a, it was an opinion piece by experts. There was no study. If you actual study, well, the actual paper was a proceeding of a get together of hand put hand selected experts who got together and and decided this was 95 percent safer. I think that's a mistake. You cannot, especially scientifically, honesty and integrity, you cannot say things that you do not know. So we do not know how, whether or not they are, how safe they are. So to claim this 95% is a disservice to science. So these and experts arbitrarily picked a number that was adopted by the Health Department of England. Yes, sir. And the Health Department of England, if I recall correctly, they were the first people to even tell the United States that there's a causal link between smoking and lung cancer back in the 50s. So I guess apparently the Health Department of England is not reliable? Not reliable, yes. Oh, that's interesting. That's, that's, they, that's good that your they opinion. Have been, they have been Trump's widely that. criticized. They think that it, the, the public health, it's not the health department, it's public health England. And public health England's recommendations are not binding. Uh, the PHE, about the, the, so the uh, several leading scientific journals have claimed that they have been helpful in the past, but this in this time, they've done a disservice to England and that this for policy, should, they should not claim that it's 95% safe. Or if they claim, they can say it's their opinion. They're perfectly welcome to say that. And they're perfectly welcome to have in the belief the system that this is going to revert the epidemic of smoking. And certainly they presented uh, findings, at least some of the findings, very selectively presented, were actually uh, favoring that, like you said, that there are lots of people who've quit smoking. I don't know whether they've quit smoking or whether they have indulged in dual use. In the United States, we've had a different experience. Uh, you talked about dating. This, uh, this is the dated material. This is 2016. So we found that there are three to five million kids who've never touched any tobacco products, have been using them. Certainly not a good thing that we can condone. Uh, and we cannot tell our kids this is 95% safe and you just go keep using these things. The second thing is that in, in contrary to the data, which is selective data from England, a large study from the United States found that there is actually e-cigarette use actually uh, prevents people from quitting by actually prolonging nicotine addiction and by uh, in most people indulge in dual use. So we have not seen any data where there has been a mass scale, a large scale shift in e-cigarette from uh, conventional cigarettes to e-cigarettes within the United States. So the six million people that quit it's not an indication that e-cigarettes work. Is that they, what you're saying? It prolongs it even though they quit over the period of like a year. Is that what you're saying? We have not seen any data where 6 million people have quit. They, might have switched. The they have switched, some of them have switched from uh, conventional cigarettes to e-cigarettes, not have become completely nicotine free. I don't think there's any period. Well, no, it's, it's not nicotine free. I mean, the problem is you wean them off slowly but surely to where they don't have to use it anymore, or if it's a lifestyle choice, they continue to maintain yes. it. So when 6 million people go completely nicotine free, we'll call that quitting. No, I agree. Yeah, and, and, and if, this is the particle delivery device. Essentially, you're delivering ultrafine particles, PM2.5, small respiratory particles, and you have a cohort of young people whose lungs are still developing that are being exposed to this. And developing lungs are more susceptible to risks associated with these types of insults than adults. And that's perfectly understandable. Nobody is saying that small children or even teenagers or anybody should be exposed to this. That's why there's lots of legislation and regulation in regards to that. But we're talking about indoor air quality. Right. Correct, which apparently countries are saying it's okay and acceptable, but the United States is standing out saying, no, according to our science, contrary to the entire EU, uh, we, do, we believe it's going to be a problem. So why is it that all of Europe says, thinks it's okay? Oh, yeah. Now you're asking us to do the same thing with another delivery device developed by the tobacco companies that are going to say it's harmless. Uh -huh. We can discuss this all day. Yes. So I just wanted to update, if you want a more up-to-date study, uh, the World Health Organization it's meeting in November uh, that the some metals are higher in the secondhand aerosol than they are in the... Um, <coughs> Some, some metals are higher in secondhand aerosol than they are in uh, cigarette smoke. And then it, it, in terms of comparison of the aerosol um, to background air, um, the things that are higher than the e-cigarette, than um, 
in the e-cigarettes are nicotine 10 to 15, 10 to 115 times higher as acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde, two to eight times higher, and formaldehyde 20 percent higher. So I think you, I think that, and this is from the World Health Organization, which which include which includes the um, EU. Yeah. Thank you. I don't want to hog the mic. Thank you very much. And one more statement to that. Not one person in this room is advocating that we're banning any of these products. We're just restricting their usage in indoor places, adding to our current law we already have. Hi there. I'm Dr. Paul Palmer. I'm a third year surgery resident at UofL. Um, so I'm here as an advocate uh, for the American Cancer Society, uh, and I really just kind of have a few points to, to, to touch upon. Uh, it's very appropriate that this is going on. This is right after I finished my vascular surgery uh, and thoracic surgery months uh, during training. Um, I think we can all agree the statement that, uh, that e-cigarettes are uh, tend to, actually I'm not going to say we're all going to agree because the people following me are not going to agree with my statements. Um, ultimately, uh, 10, 20, 50 years from now, we're not going to look back and say, uh, man, I cannot believe that we were so ignorant as to uh, ban uh, e-cigarettes or form of inhaled uh, nicotine. Um, uh, allowing these to be in indoor spaces. Uh, it, this uh, kind of debate reminds me a lot of uh, whenever uh, I wasn't around, but uh, when they tried to introduce uh, filters uh, to cigarettes, and I said, "Hey, this is a much safer alternative. Uh, this is this is really the way we need to go. It's going to take out all the bad things." Um, personally, I uh, I understand we're taking tar out of uh, the 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 cigarette uh, uh, experience, but um, my experience with the uh, seeing how. Uh, nicotine affects uh, people in public health uh, having to amputate legs, um, having to take out lung cancers and things like that, and knowing that those are directly related uh, to the nicotine that these products deliver. Um, personally, I just am, I'm here to advocate that, uh, that we just get these out. We're not saying people, you can't smoke your e-cigarettes, but we're just trying to make it a cleaner, safe, cleaner uh, space, and I think that this is a perfect forum for that. So, uh, thank you all. <laughs> Uh, my name is Troy LeBlanc. Uh, I distribute, I export, I import. Uh, I have retail stores, um, all electronic cigarettes. I also sit on the Kentucky Smoke Free Association board. Um, a couple points I wanted to make. I did notice that in your testing, um, with respect to the event, uh, the event, was, was that who was that? Was that you? Okay, the, the event showed uh, levels as high as uh, 800 on the PM 2.5. Um, in a room with a thousand people whose sole purpose of being there is for vapor and to test vapor products continuously at different tables to test flavors. And wouldn't you agree that cigarettes at their max are 1200 PM 2.5 for a single cigarette in a room? You know, you know, yes, there, there was levels as high as 1200 for a single cigarette you, you, in a chamber test, Yes, sir. you know, um, one thing I, I really wanted to drive home uh, is when I first started my business, it was for money. And I wanted to make money. But when, uh, when a 70-year-old woman comes in who hasn't smoked a cigarette in a week, and she had smoked cigarettes for 50 years straight, it changes everything. Absolutely everything. And you know, e-cigarettes, you may not agree, save lives, but they are safer. And you can't walk into a convenience store right now and say, hey, let me get a pack of Marlboros with less nicotine. You get one level of nicotine across the board. You know what we do? We, we provide plans for our people to start at a certain nicotine level and pare their way down. I just came out, I just came out with a new product that's 12 bottles, 12 nicotine levels, and you go down one nicotine level every bottle you finish until you hit zero. We are helping people. We are absolutely helping people. Do I think it's safe? Me, an, an importer, a distributor, an exporter, a manufacturer, a retailer, I'm telling you it's not safe. Absolutely not. Is it safer than a cigarette? Hell yes. So, so I agree with you that this is, that there is, 
evidence to suggest that the cigarettes would might be safer. We are just not sure what number to ascribe to them. Sure. That 95% or 50%, we don't know that yet. So that's out. The, the thing with public health policy, and as, as, as somebody who can advocate for that, we can listen to stories or anecdotes. We have to ultimately rely on evidence. If there was a very large, well uh, sort of sampled study which shows that yes, e-cigarettes can help people quit cigarettes altogether, we would change our policies. We believe in what the evidence suggests. But we don't. There are anecdotal uh, evidences there. Yes, that's true. But we cannot go by that because lots of things work by placebo. But the bigger problem is this. You say that they, we have e-cigarettes and it's really heartening to see people switch from cigarettes to e-cigarettes and they're much healthier. But the other side of the equation is that we are committing three to five million kids lifelong habit of nicotine addiction. Now, we have to decide how as a society we're going to weigh these risks. So are we happy if you know, whatever, some 10% or 20% really old people stop smoking and feel much better. At the same time, are we willing to pay the price of recruiting 5 million kids into this habit? Okay. That's what the society my, we have to face a question. My second question is, is would you rather them smoke? Number one. And number two, do you know when the 18 plus law was brought into effect? Yes. So if the, we know, we know I, from I'm, the data that the rates of smoking were going down. So the people who have started, the kids who started smoking e-cigs are not who would have smoked anyway. So it's not a choice that would rather smoke or rather do e-cigarettes. They are doing e-cigarettes de novo. And so we would have had these had a, a sort of a generation of tobacco nicotine free kids if it was not for e-cigarettes. But, but we would have a generation of tobacco smokers. Yes, right. So that's why we have, no, we wouldn't have generation, we have we'd come down. The, the, we have more people. Since, since when? Since 2010. 2010. 2010. E-cigarettes were introduced in 2008. Yes, so they have, they, we have consistently going, seeing the rates come down. And so if we had so e when e-cigarettes were introduced, you saw less tobacco smoking in children? The smart, tobacco smoking is coming down that, all the way. We have, in but, the last year... But you just said in 2010, it started going down. No, 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 going down. Well, isn't that what you just said? No. In, in, he's correcting it now. Yes. Okay. It started well so, before that. No, no, let me explain to you the data. The data are that in 2011, or 2016, we have kids, as many kids addicted to tobacco as we were in 2010. So we had come down so that only whatever 5% of the kids were using uh, any nicotine product. Now we've come back up to... Uh, to the levels we were in 2010. Okay, well, back to my original question. Do you, do you know when the, the law for 18 plus came into effect? About a year and a half ago, you? No, it came, it came into effect for the U.S. Well, it came into effect. About a year and a half ago. Well, in, in August 8th, 2016. Okay. There are trade associations around the country that have been alive for two, three years that won't allow you in well before the laws were put in place for 18 plus. I there put 18. in Kentucky selling them to kids all over the place up Where? until a year and a half ago. Bardstown Road. Where? Yes, and there is. Well, well give no. give me an instance of when. I I, I mean we we have we. Yeah. <laughs> we've, been, we've been 18 plus, but that's not an e-cigarette store. I mean that's that's a that's a that's yeah, that's, that's what regular. Well, my wife teaches middle school. I promise there are kids with vape pens all over the place in middle school walking around with vape pens. Yes. Well, Again, so, through CPS so policy. So um, and <laughs> we. We want to be respectful of your opinion and everyone's opinion and comments, but I think the thing, the point of interest here is what we're talking about is indoor air quality and the effects that these devices have on indoor air quality. We're not arguing the point whether or not they're a safer cessation tool that are they're safer than smoking. Sure. Our focus is more on the non-users of the devices and what the impacts are on indoor air quality. So. I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time too and give them to have opportunity to have comments but we're going to have other opportunities for feedback and comments and we certainly welcome your comments Can okay I just say one last sure thing. you said that there's no prolonged studies that say that e cigarettes are safer would you also agree that there's no prolonged studies that said that they're dangerous yes exactly yes all right that's it and one other, when you asked about the, the youth rates going down in the state of Kentucky, when I began, and I'm not saying I didn't do with it, but the high school smoking rates in 1997 in the state of Kentucky were 47% of high school students smoked. Now we're down to around 20%. Now the number's going back up with nicotine addicted kids. Hello, my name is Keith Hadley with Kentucky Smoke Free Association. I'm also a retail shop owner. Um, He's very passionate. 
Uh, but I appreciate this panel being here today. Uh, for the most part, I was here to, to see what you had to say, to see as exactly what information you did have about vaping, because obviously we don't know all of the answers, but we, I would say that we agree uh, that it is, <clears throat> in my opinion, a, a cleaner product, uh, which you're not arguing. So today we're talking about the indoor smoking ban, correct? So for us to be able to pursue this technology, have more, have more studies done on it, and for us as retail owners to be able to help people to at least get off of traditional tobacco. One of the main things that is so successful in my stores, and I'm sure in everybody else's stores, is the fact that they can come in, they have customer service, they have uh, a test bar there, so they have different flavors. A lot of people, they'll come in and say, I've really tried to quit smoking, I want a tobacco flavor. We have that to offer for them. A lot of people don't want to taste tobacco because for those who smoke, you know after the second cigarette from the first time you smoke, you lose your palate, you can't taste anything, you can't smell anything. So we ask them, okay, what kind of foods do you like? You know, do you like strawberries? Do you like this or that? That is the main focus for us because each individual is unique in what they need. So we can't, you can go to a gas station and get menthol, mint, you know, tobacco flavor, okay? Those devices, in, in my opinion, those devices are e-cigarettes. And I don't like the term e-cigarettes because for a shop that sells tobacco, cigars, and e-cigarettes as a convenience to a consumer who is unaware of actual vapor products that work, those products are, are not as efficient as the products that we use in our stores. The picture that you showed on there as far as the, and you said that the technology is, you know, it, it's so fast. Well, after the FDA, de the, the deeming rules went into effect, those products are not alone, long, they're no longer gonna keep coming on the market. So you're gonna have time to study these products to see exactly the effectiveness and the second hair particulates and all of that. I'm not a doctor, obviously, but I do feel it is safer. So if this is passed to include vapor stores, then our customers are no longer, going, we're not gonna be able to help them as efficiently. If a customer comes in, they wanna quit smoking into a vapor store, which we represent, we don't represent uh, the other types of stores, okay, that sell those products. If they come into our store, they are aware that they're, they've heard about vapor, they've heard about these things. So they're aware that there is gonna be vapor in the air, but they're also aware that they wanna make the switch. Employees of vapor stores, they are not there, they are there on their own will. They want, they vape themselves. So when I read your, your the material and did all kinds of research. I have this huge thing I wrote, but I didn't know what to expect coming here today as far as what I'd be able to say. I find that public, public smoking ban I agree with. I don't want to go into a restaurant and have somebody smoking there in front of my kids. I'm not an advocate to be able to blow clouds everywhere because that's not exactly what this industry is about. We're about helping people. So by using your own moral judge of character and saying, okay, I'm not gonna go in a movie theater and blow clouds on a kid, obviously those establishments where there is people that do not smoke and do not vape and don't want to be around that, they have every right to imply this in those establishments. But I also believe that business owners have the right as well, especially in our business, to make that decision for ourselves. And if you come into the store, you know what you're going into. Okay, so that's just my opinion. Now, as far as particulate matter, one thing, one question I have for you, and actually, because you are a prestigious panel, um, we all know that uh, inhalers for asthma patients have propylene glycol in them, correct? So, obviously, when you use an inhaler, you don't exhale it on somebody else. So that is not considered a particulate matter, correct? No, so they're not exhaling it because okay. it stays in their lungs. But you do use the delivery system of PG, mm -hmm. in which case in breathing treatments as well. So mm -hmm. it's been used medically mm -hmm. for quite a while. Yes. My grandmother had pneumonia. They brought in a breathing machine, and in the ingredients is PG. And yes, 
to create that vapor. And that vapor is heavier than smoke, goes down to the lungs, and helps clear out any congestion, correct? Mm -hmm. That, in my opinion, is the same version of what we're using, but it's smaller. And as far as I feel personally, and I'm sure any vapor here can tell you, that I went from trying to quit smoking three packs a day, and I was successful with vaping, and I believe in it. And that's why I opened the store to help people. I've helped over 3,000 people in two years, all of which we do ID. And, and I did a study in my own shop alone, 36%, it may not seem like a lot, but they are on zero nicotine now. And they just do it for the hand to mouth habit. So it, as far as you're concerned, I understand public health. But if this impacts small businesses and revenue for the state of Kentucky, we are the people trying to help to clean up our air, to help people become healthier. We are the people who are advocating for people not to smoke. Like I said, I don't believe we should be compared to e-cigarettes because that was a horrible term from the beginning. And the fact that it says cigarettes, I, I don't agree with. So I appreciate your time. Thank really you very much. I appreciate your feedback. Thank you very much. I've got one more comment. Yes, yeah, comment here. I wanted to uh, mention one more comment on that. The stats I gave a few minutes ago, ago from the World Health Organization study was on in the section called Health Risks to Bystanders from Exposure to Exhaled Aerosol from N ENDS and ENDS users. So it is higher, and it is from the ex exhalation. I can't speak to asthma inhalers, but... Right. Go ahead. I was going to comment to, again, I completely appreciate the business end of this, but I can say as an advocate, it was part of the Smoke Free Louisville campaign. It comes up in every time there's a secondhand smoke ordinance. It comes up every time there's a secondhand smoke ordinance that the cigarette or nicotine industry um, advocates for exemptions to allow for businesses who sell the products. And we went through this with cigar bars, right? Cigar bar says, we only sell cigars. People come in and know they're getting cigars. The issue comes in in dosages. It was interesting that you brought up the asthma inhaler because, again, it's a whole dosage issue. If you're comparing the volume of PG in an asthma inhaler to the volume you're getting in one puff, even, of a vape pen, I, I, I don't know the numbers, but I can imagine the dosages are significantly different. And that's what goes through then with the tobacco and nicotine business in the establishments that are trying to get the exemption for exclusive right to allow consumption of their products in their stores. It's a dosage issue. Yes, the people that sell your product may or may not vape. I, I, I'll take your word. You say they all do. I don't know. Um, but I've heard, you know, every waitress smokes as well, and I know that's not a fact either. So uh, I'll, I'll take your word for it. But the fact is, when you're not vaping, you're not taking that in. If you allow that in your store, those particulates are remaining in the air. And so the entire time you're at work, you're exposed to those particulates. So from a public health standpoint, yes, you're getting a dosage every time you hit your vape pen. But Beyond that, you're not. And so that's the whole advantage of taking it outside. You're getting your one exposure. Then you go back inside and you're protected. And that's the public health reason that we strongly advocate against exemptions in public health policy. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the scientific stuff back forth. I appreciate that we're not trying to put a business out. We're trying to, we're talking about public smoking. But I just want to talk some anecdotal stuff. I've been teaching at the same community college for 14 years. And in my opinion, I'm seeing more and more people standing outside e-smoking, or whatever you want to call it, vaping. They're sitting there. And longer times, in other words, the breaks used to be five minutes for a cigarette. Now they're out. It's like an inhaling thing. And that's my anecdotal evidence. And my anecdotal evidence from people that I know that have tried to stop quitting, now they're, they got that thing all the time. It's like a constant thing. So I see, seemingly to me, an addiction. And I think it does. If I hang around by the door and talk to these people, because now some faculty are starting to join on smoking, I, I kind of feel like you're in that. I don't want to keep standing there anymore. So I think it is. I'm, what we're talking about, I, what I don't want is to have to smoke somebody else's stuff or breathe in stuff. That's what we're talking about. It's great if it helps somebody smoke, but and it only, I don't know anybody that's helped stop smoking. If anything, they're, they're doing inhaling more stuff per day than they did before. It may be better stuff, but, you know, so... Yeah, let's help people to keep stop smoking, but let's not make us all have to breathe that stuff. So we're talking, if you're just talking about public spaces and stopping kids, and kids are smoking a lot more and in e-cigarettes. So that's what I'm for. Thank you. You actually got the, the, the major issue unraveled, which is that if, suppose the e-cigarettes are 50% safer than normal cigarettes, but you smoke at twice as much, 
we are at almost at the same place. The, the thing with the cigarette, it's finite, it burns itself and it's ended, and, but you, once you start, you have to finish. The thing with e-cigarettes is that you can do it intermittently and continuously. So there is this big concern that it might actually increase the level of addiction and that could be coming out as people using more often than they should. Sir, if you'd like to step up. We are down to about eight minutes left for the forum. So. I'm Christopher Kellams. I am associated with a shop that is associated with KSFA. Um, I'm terrified of public speaking. <laughs> So I'm a little frazzled. Um, not to discount your study, but what voltages were you testing the vapor at? There, the, so we, we've looked at a whole range of voltages, uh -huh. and the, the stronger the voltage means the more the temperature, more six volts and higher, Correct. would get to what you get is what you call a dry puff. So all the way from the beginning to the end in the voltage range, there is a range of increase in these toxic substances. Correct. So the more you, the higher the voltage, the more the uh, toxicants, particularly aldehydes. Not only that, in, at least in, in six, uh, the uh, cigalikes, if your tank is half empty, which has more air in it, you triple or quadruple the generation of these toxic compounds. So it depends upon how much air you have in that tank and then what voltage and temperature you're using. Correct, but are you using actual, and like you said, it's constantly evolving, are you using actual devices for this or are you using a controlled environment where you're applying a certain amount of voltage to the substance? Well, it depends on the study. Some of the studies when we expose, say, animals or we just measure toxicants, we use a smoking machine set at different voltages. In some, when they measure changes or, uh, uh, in people, we actually let them uh, use the device as they feel most comfortable with. So it varies. Okay. Um, I had so much right there, and then I get here. <sighs> and I can't remember what it was, and I apologize. Um, I may come back around. Let me collect myself. So. Go right ahead. Call it Thank right. you, sir. Thank you. My name is Billy Bryant. I uh, represent a uh, local manufacturer and I'm also a member of the KSFA. Uh, I personally will tell you that I vape now. I vape zero nicotine juice. I don't use nicotine. Haven't used nicotine in 10 years. I use it as, as you can tell, I'm a large guy. It helps me to, cur to curb cravings for other things. I got into vaping to, say, to help my girlfriend because she was a pack a day smoker. Her doctor told her that if she didn't stop smoking, she was going to die out, die on an operating table because she had to have a major operation. She was anemic, and the nicotine or is a blood thinner. We all know that. Everybody knows that. That does does any research, you know. So I got her into vaping. We switched her to an e-cigarette. Within a month's time, she was reduced from a pack a day to zero nicotine. Was completely off of nicotine for three months. To long enough for her to do her, her, her surgery, be nicotine free. She came through that. She still smokes, or she still vapes zero nicotine juice. Every now and then she does a three milligram nicotine er, bottle and lasts her a week. So three milligrams of nicotine over a week is a lot less nicotine than you're gonna put in a person's body and into the air over a pack a day, you know. I have bronchial asthma. I carry this thing every day. I've used it once in six months. And before I started vaping, I guarantee you, I used it at least four times a day. I haven't changed anything about my habits other than I added this, in, or added this right here into my routine. Zero nicotine, so I'm not absorbing any nicotine. I'm not putting nicotine out for other people. And we are talking about public spaces. Why can we not let people govern themselves? Why can we not let a business decide? Do I want to subject my, my employees or my patrons to this? Why can we not let those businesses make the decision for themselves? Give them the information. Make sure that they're properly aware of whatever studies have been done on both sides of the count, you know, pro and against, and make, let them make an informed decision. If, if, if a business wants to continue to allow it, why can they not do that for a healthier alternative? 
a good question, and we appreciate your input. We've got about five minutes until the educational forum is going to conclude, so we will take that um, statement under advisement and, and certainly want to hear others' opinions. So if we can be timely in our can comments. I just quickly, can yes. I just quickly say that um, a lot of times workers don't get to choose where they work. And the, like it's been said before, we're just simply asking e-cigarette users to step outside where that aerosol won't harm others and that are working in that environment. So it's not taking away your right to use that product, it's just asking you to step outside and use it where it won't harm others. Uh, Dr. Nancy York from Bellarmine University and also a volunteer for the American Heart Association. Um, and I think, Monica, you just stated everything I was going to very succinctly. Um, I thank you to, to Mayor Fisher and the Public Health Department. I mean, this is a public health issue. I don't think we can disagree on that. Um, and I think it's very important for everyone to realize that no one is being told they can't use e-cigarettes or hookahs. It's, it's in the manner or where they do it. And we're just asking for public health. That's all we're asking. So thank you all. Thank you. We have time for one or two more comments or questions. Um, most vapors understand that there's an unwritten law amongst us. If you wouldn't smoke somewhere, if you wouldn't smoke somewhere, you don't vape there either. This is pretty much, there's no carved in stone rule for this, but wouldn't you say, Troy, everybody else, you don't, you don't vape or you don't smoke. Um, and if people are vaping, I apologize on behalf of the vaping community. They're being jerks. Um, the thing that I don't understand, it, you say that the EU study doesn't matter, but don't you feel that it's unethical to just dismiss that? I, I mean, even if it is anecdotal, there's enough evidence that even if it's anecdotal evidence, and I debate all the time, so I know that that's a logical fallacy, but even if it is anecdotal, don't you think it's worth looking at? If, if it was a study, we would consider it seriously, but it's an opinion. So, and, and anecdotes are not evidence. Right. I agree no, with but, you. No, that doesn't even have anecdote. They didn't say that they have anecdotes. They said that in our expert opinion, we believe that that's what it is. It's not even, it's even below the level of anecdotes. And again, we're not contesting whether or not they're safer than cigarettes right. or they work to serve a purpose of a cessation tool. Right. Our focus is strictly the impacts that they create on indoor air quality. I understand that. That is a focus of this entire discussion. So. Comparing, in a lot of ways, comparing cigarettes and e-cigarettes are like comparing apples and chainsaws. Yeah. It's not nearly the same thing. They just have a similar name. But, but that's not the argument. I think it's a voluntary, involuntary argument. I don't want to breathe. And I agree with you. I, I'm, you. I'm with but you But there are that. places that have to be managed in order to allow that to occur. Slippery slope either way. So I understand where you're coming from, but at the same time, if you start regulating it here before long, you won't even be able to vape in a vape shop, you know? And I understand that you don't want to breathe it, and someone earlier, and I apologize because I don't remember who it was, said that tobacco companies started these e-cigarettes. That's not the case by any stretch. Like, tobacco companies are sponsoring these legislations to get e-cigarettes shut down, so they're not nearly the same thing. It was started by this person, I told you, in China, started this. But the big tobacco has bought most of the e-cigarette companies now, and those are the ones that really want to control. And one of the side effects of the FDA deeming would be or possibly could be that the small operations may not have the budget or the resources to meet the regulation that the big tobacco can. So it may inadvertently help big tobacco more than mom and pop operations. And the FDA is concerned about that. And so they have, have, a diff they have given a sort of a, a master rule which they could, the small businesses could use so that they don't get elbowed out of the market by the big tobacco. Thank you for your time. So thank you. And that's going to conclude the time that we have for questions and comments. But the one thing that I want to share is that this flyer is available. And it has information available to you. It has the, the um, website for where this broadcast will be uh, archived. So you can go and watch this broadcast as well as it has information on a public opinion mechanism or a public feedback mechanism 
and how you can access a survey and provide not only quantitative data to us with regard to this process, but you can provide qualitative feedback. So your written comments will be taken into consideration as we move forward with this process. And the one thing that, that I want to say uh, on behalf of the mayor and, and our department is thank you for your participation uh, and thank you for your passion around this issue. And we certainly want to use all of this feedback to inform this discussion as we move forward. And I truly do appreciate all of your attendance and participation in this very, very serious public health issue. And thank you and have a good night. This has been a Metro TV production, a public service of Louisville Metro Government.